please welcome to the stage Corinna Gore, who was with us in Union Hill in February and is with us here today. She is the founder and director of the Center for Earth e Ethics. Please welcome Corinna Gore. giving some acknowledgments and love to the people that work so hard to make this happen. So you know who you are, if you could raise your hand, if you've been on the organizing committee and the team. Took a lot of work. Took a lot of work. And if I call out names, I'll probably get in trouble. So, But I, I'm, I'm thinking of, of the hours that were put in and uh, how everything came together so beautifully. This is the most beautiful crowd I've ever seen with so many faces and voices from all walks of life coming together for our shared future, for life, for justice. And I want to say a few things, don't want to take too long. First, about the urgency of the climate crisis. And I know Many people have been thinking about it kind of in the back of their minds uh, as we've heard more and more reports, scientific studies. Uh, the timelines um, are shrinking where we can get ahead of this possibility of ecological collapse. And I just want to say this is a moral issue. Anybody who has just that vague sense of feeling unsettled. I know many of us here are already committed, but to those who might be listening from their homes, to those who are passing by, there is a chance to make a difference. And this is it. Systemic change. This is about much more than our personal actions that we can do, uh, and those are important, but actually changing the systems are even more important. There are three groups that will be most affected by ecological collapse by climate crisis. And those are the most vulnerable and marginalized people in the world, the poor, children and future generations, and other species, other living beings that we share this world with. So to keep in mind that those here speaking up for the earth are also speaking for those three categories that, of people, those, those three empty seats, as a friend of mine says, that should be in every single room when people are making a decision about energy infrastructure. I want to say something about what we know as natural gas. So, there is a big reckoning right now about fracking and methane and fracked gas. And it's happening all over the country where there is an overbuild of this fossil fuel. And the reason that it's happened is because some time ago, people focused on one fact, that when it is burned, it emits half of the carbon emissions as coal, CO2, fully half. But there are a few things that we know very clearly now about fracking and fracked gas that are important for every single legislator and every single decision maker in the state of Virginia to look squarely at and take seriously. One is that methane, which leaks naturally from fracking and fracked gas operations, is up to 80 sometimes more heat trapping in our global atmosphere than CO2 emissions over a 20 year period. Another thing that we know now that's changed is we don't have 20 years. Do we wanna solve climate change now? Do we wanna confront this crisis now? We don't have 20 years. We have to change these systems right now. We know that fracking disrupts communities, it pollutes water and air where it goes on as well. But another thing that's changed is that renewable energy is, and batteries are cheaper and they're more accessible and we have the ability to make this transition. So why would we not do it? All over the country there is this, this recognition that there's an overbuild and that they're, they're, they're going to be, a, they're, will be locked into an old system of energy that, uh, that is fossil fuels. 
at the exact time when we need to be making this change. I'm in New York. We just had a great victory against the Williams Pipeline. Still, still actually may come back because of the nature, as we know, of how these regulatory agencies have the power that they do. What regulatory agencies should be doing on the federal and the state level is standing up for people, for communities, not the corporate interests that are giving donations to our political system. But we know we have gotten off track in this country. We know that. And so within, within this system, we have to make very clear, fracked gas is a fossil fuel. We do not need a fracked gas pipeline in the state of Virginia. And I want to say I'm very excited. I'll be going to Leesburg tomorrow um, and joining with the MVP folks um, to fight that pipeline, which is already being constructed. And that is urgent. And we will be there standing together. You know. They called fracked gas a bridge fuel. This is a bridge. We just walked over a bridge. It takes you from solid ground to solid ground. Pastor Paul talked earlier about building bridges with each other. That's what we're doing. We're getting to know people from all walks of life. Fracked gas is not a bridge. Overbuild of fracked gas infrastructure is a long walk off a short pier, not a bridge. So we're going to put that to rest. Okay, environmental racism. The same pollutants, the same activities, the burning of fossil fuels that contribute to climate change also contribute to the ambient air pollution that causes so many severe health problems. This connection, the connection between the story of ecological crisis and the story of race are so, is so important to grasp. And we can look at the patterns we can look at the facts. There was, uh, in, for asthma, for childhood asthma, African American children are 10 times more likely to die that, for, of childhood asthma than white children of, in this country. The number one indicator of the site of a toxic facility in this country is race. There was just a study that was done, I want to tell you the name of who did it, by the Proceedings of Natural Academy of, Sci of Sciences released in March that showed the very stark racial disparity in who breathes toxic air in our country. And it is even more stark compared with who is responsible racially, disproportionately, for the amount of toxins that go into the air. We need to pay attention to this. And Virginia must lead the way. Last night, I revisited two pieces of writing by Virginians. And one was the Declaration of Independence. Uh, and the other was this book, The Hidden and the Forgotten, Contributions of Buckingham Blacks to American History by Charles W. White. This was given to me when I visited Union Hill. And it is full of very interesting history, research, original research. and. A few things I want to mention. First of all, the depth of this culture, uh, the, the contributions that people of African American descent have made to our country defending in the armed forces, in education, Carter Woodson, who's responsible for, for Black History Month as we know it, along with so much else. You can learn about Carter Woodson's parents and their stories, and many other great cultural strengths uh, from this region, from this people. The other thing is the history. And I know that we're here on an anniversary of the Poor People's Campaign. And I was struck when I was reading uh, th this part of the very painful history of race. And the reason why it's important to revisit this and to talk about it together is that it is the legacy that we're living with. And as Reverend Barber has said, it's not about the statues, it's about the statutes. It's not just about the symbols, it's about the policies. We just marched across the Robert E. Lee Bridge. That bridge, I learned, was, was, used to be called the Ra James River Bridge. When, in 1933, the city bought it. It was called the James R River Bridge. It was named for Robert E. Lee later. But we marched across that bridge to come here together to talk about systemic 
racism. Not just symbols, but laws and policies and real people's lives. And so, I want to read from this that this talks about in the 1660s when the laws were put in place in Virginia that really gave birth to American slavery. This was not something that came about without considerable effort to put laws on the books and enforce them. And so it began with children being sold away from their mothers and laws enabling that. And then in 1660, the Virginia Assembly ruled that persons from Christian nations, meaning European nations, must not be given long periods of indenture, but specifically excluded servants from African or American Indian backgrounds. Two years later, the word slave first appeared in Virginia law. This same year, planters were given a large tax reduction of 80% if their tobacco tax was paid with imported African Americans. In 1669, a Virginia law declared it no felony if a master or overseer killed a slave who resisted. And so after 1700s, the necessary laws have been passed to give birth to American slavery. So 1669 is 350 years ago that it was declared it is not a felony if you murder a person of African descent if they resist this system. And that is the same system that we have seen throughout history, the same mindset that we've seen throughout history that some people seek to reinforce and some people seek to break down for justice. And so from the Declaration of Independence, I was reminded, and we all know Thomas Jefferson made mistakes as well, but that was a prophetic document with some very noble truths in it that have since been claimed and redeemed and fought for by people from Abraham Lincoln to Septa McClark and Ella Baker and many others. And in it, I was reminded that, first of all, there were some abuses of power that were specifically described. And it reminded me a little bit that when some of these actions are taken by a corporate government alliance, like dismissing air pollution control board members right before a vote on a compressor station because they have raised issues of racial justice, because they have raised issues that these are poisons that will be like slow violence against the people that are living there, that may even take their livelihood, their well-being, and possibly even their life. When those things are being raised in a group of people that is public servants designated to talk about that and be for the common good and the public interest, and then a, a political official says, we don't like where you're going with this. We want to dismiss this group and prevent them from making the public decision based on that information. That is an abuse of power of the kind that goes to the essence of what we're doing here in this country, what that declaration meant in 1776, written by a Virginian. The other thing I want to say, and we know the same thing is true, the, the, the way that they, that they worked with the Environmental Justice Advisory Board was also not honest and forthright and clear. These agencies, these groups, there are people trying to make government work for justice, for equity, and they're and, and, and we need to be sure to be in there and make sure that we cannot tolerate these abuses of power anymore. The other thing I want to mention is that the Declaration cites as an authority, as the only authority cited for this new nation, nature and nature's God. There are laws of nature. You don't have to believe in climate change any more than you have to believe in gravity. We must as human beings and communities align with the laws of nature. We must live within the bounds of natural law. And we must not tolerate it when people want to destroy our shared land, air, and water because they say it's their property. It's not property. It's our inheritance. And so we're not here by accident. Not every single one of us is here for a reason. We're all gathered together for a reason. We hold these truths to be self-evident. 
We will treat each other with equal dignity and justice. We will make democratic self-government work, and we will live responsibly on this planet. It's a sacred place. Thank you. And I'm really proud. I'm really proud to be here with my dear brother and colleague William Will Barber. So I just want to say that I forgot to mention him in my talk. Someone else will introduce him now. But thank you. Thanks for welcoming. How many know water is life? The pipeline set us up for a fatal catastrophe. We're taken to the streets, begging to stop this, please. Pipeline compared to lifeline, no comparisons indeed. Pipeline compared to lifeline, cause of corporate greed. 